By the end of the decade, 70% of people living with HIV will be over the age of 50, according to researchers. That's due to advances in medicine. But aging with HIV comes with an increased risk of other health problems, and some experts worry failing to adequately care for this population could undermine decades of progress fighting the virus. Sam Whitehead from our partner KFF Health News reports. Malcolm Reed stands in his kitchen in his house outside of Atlanta and pulls up a smartphone app that helps him keep track of all of his medications. 50.3 milligrams, that's my HIV meds. I have my multivitamins, omega fish oil, vitamin C. The app is linked to an automated dispenser, which helps Reed juggle the multiple pills he takes each day to treat his HIV, high blood pressure, and type 2 diabetes. Reed recently celebrated his 66th birthday. He's also celebrating another important milestone having lived 28 years with HIV. I'm just happy to be here, you know? It's like you were diagnosed and, you know, you weren't supposed to be here. And you're here. Aging with HIV can bring a host of other health issues. But clinicians, researchers, and advocates say providers often don't have the proper skills to handle them. HIV doctors aren't often trained in geriatrics and vice versa. Poorer care means worse health and can even lead people to neglect their HIV. Melanie Thompson is an HIV clinician in Atlanta. Even though the population is not dying from AIDS at the rate that was occurring in the 1990s, people with HIV have more comorbidities than people without HIV at a given age. Conditions like diabetes, heart disease, and depression. And that can force people to take on the onerous task of coordinating care between a lot of different doctors. They are often dealing with multiple consultants, cardiologists, neurologists, kidney doctors, liver doctors. Um, it becomes quite complex. Taking more medications to manage multiple conditions increases the risk of dangerous drug interactions. Another major challenge is loneliness. Many people aging with HIV have lost friends and family to the epidemic. Heidi Crane is an HIV clinician at the University of Washington. I would provide such better care of my patients if I had the ability to write a prescription for a friend. Isolation can increase the risk of cognitive decline and can lead individuals to stop HIV treatment. And all that care is a lot for the federal Ryan White program to manage. It runs clinics for low-income people with HIV across the U.S. Its patient population is growing and aging, but the program's core funding hasn't changed much in the last decade. That can present tough spending decisions, says Laura Cheever, who oversees the Ryan White program. When you're at a community level and you're seeing you've got a lot of people that aren't getting enough services to even be in care, how do you decide when that next dollar is spent? Cheever also says researchers still have a lot to learn about the best ways to meet the needs of those aging with HIV. Her agency recently launched a $13 million project to test out ways to better serve them, like how to better screen for conditions like dementia and frailty. For many of the people that are aging with HIV, they were sort of pioneers in HIV treatment. And now they're some of the first people to be aging with HIV. And so uh, we are learning as we go. But Jules Levin, who runs the National AIDS Treatment Advocacy Project, worries it's too little, too late. The 74-year-old has been living with HIV for nearly 40 years. Frankly, it's ageism on a vast scale by our federal government, by our researchers, and by the advocacy community as well, because they have ignored the problem to a large degree. Levin worries if that trend continues, it could have dangerous implications for the health of those like himself who have already survived so much. Sam Whitehead is a correspondent with our partner KFF Health News. The future of HIV treatment is injectable. Promising drugs could expand treatment if we get out of our own way. As Sidney Adjady laid on an exam table at Harborview Medical Center with his t-shirt hiked up, research clinician Phoebe Bryson Kahn examined injection sites on either side of his belly button. In April, University of Washington researchers at the UW Positive Research Clinic injected Adjady with about a teaspoon of a new and experimental long-acting HIV treatment as part of a study funded by the National Institutes of Health. They're monitoring him to learn how long this medication lasts in his body and whether it could effectively suppress the HIV if the virus had been present. Adjady doesn't have HIV, nor do any of the 12 participants in phase one of this proof-of-concept clinical drug trial. At this early stage, researchers are evaluating dosing and safety because the drug has never been used on humans before. They'll determine efficacy in phase two, but that could be years away. Injectables are a thrilling trend in the field of HIV, 
with drugs such as lenacapavir and cabinuva already available on the market. Unfortunately, the rollout has been slower than physicians hoped, and barriers like the expense of these drugs keep them out of reach for many. This new shot combines three commonly used oral medications into one lipid-bonded nanoparticle the researchers call an analyzenge. A shot of the nanolozenges could theoretically keep HIV in check for a month or longer, replacing 30 to 90 daily pills, Dr. Rodney Ho, the principal UW researcher who developed the drug and co-founded UW's targeted, long-acting and combination antiretroviral therapy program, called it an impossible marriage of fat and water-soluble drugs that took years to figure out. Named for its oblong shape and diminutive size, roughly a million times smaller than a chicken egg, the lozenges are injected beneath the skin into a fatty area like the belly. Then they travel to the lymph nodes via the bloodstream. The lozenge analogy ends with their shape, though, because they don't just dissolve. Instead, they journey through the lymphatic system like a city bus, stopping at nodes to drop off a specific concentration of antiretroviral drugs. This approach targets the virus far more efficiently than daily pills, which bathe our GI tract in medication and contribute to wear and tear. Scientists have successfully developed nanoparticle drugs to treat illnesses such as leukemia. But this experiment represents a new strategy for treating HIV, the study's leader, Dr. Rachel Bender Ignacio, said the researchers aim to formulate and bring to market a similar drug with three other compounds, tenofovir disaproxil, lamivudine, and dolutegravir, aka TLD, the most common frontline treatment of HIV in the world. She said that an injectable version of this drug cocktail could change the lives of the 19 million people already on TLD worldwide, which works out to almost half the number of people with HIV on Earth. Though we may see cheaper drugs in the near future, there are a number of good reasons to create alternatives to pills. Some people with HIV struggle to get pills and to take the ones they've got. Unstable housing situations or addiction can stymie access, and some people may be too sick to swallow. Some agricultural and migrant workers can't access a continuous stream of medication, and pharmacies may have trouble stocking them. A daily pill can be a painful reminder that you have HIV, and traveling with pills is a hassle, comes with stigma, and can be dangerous. Also, pill fatigue is real, and some people just forget. Over time, skipping daily meds can be fatal. In February, study participant Ajidi's half-sister in Ghana died from a bout of typhoid fever related to her HIV infection. Not taking viral suppressant medication weakened her immune system, and the fever killed her in two days. They weren't close, but participating in the study gives him the opportunity to honor her memory, he said. Even if UW's new approach works, Dr. Bender Ignacio said the fight against HIV-AIDS will never end. Viruses mutate, and HIV is particularly leaky, many times craftier and mutable than the flu or COVID-19. That said, from a biomedical standpoint doctors can easily treat HIV with current tools. Patients take two or three pills to prevent breakthroughs. Think of a medieval city with multiple defensive walls. If one falls, more remain. The walls are sturdy and in many ways sufficient. What we can't seem to figure out is the human element, poverty, homelessness, individual behavior, geographical barriers, our convoluted medical system, etc. A miracle in the lab won't undo systemic problems. 9 million of the 39 million people with HIV are not virologically suppressed. In the US, a third of people with HIV don't have the medications they need, and they are often our society's most vulnerable people. Dr. Monica Gandhi, who teaches medicine at University of California, San Francisco, and who directs San Francisco's Ward 86 HIV clinic, said HIV treatment reached a point of stagnation six years ago after the advent of Bictarvi, a complete, once-daily HIV regimen that included an integrase inhibitor, which targets an enzyme HIV uses to replicate. It should be easy to take one pill, but it isn't for everyone, and that's why long-acting treatments are all clinicians like Dr. Gandhi can talk about now. She works with HIV-positive people experiencing homelessness in San Francisco. When Cabanuva first entered the market, clinicians hesitated to prescribe it to patients who took pills inconsistently. 
Doctors worried these patients would miss injection appointments and expose the HIV virus in their bodies to trailing levels of the medication, pushing the virus toward drug-resistant mutations, but Dr. Gandhi's patients showed up, and experiencing viral suppression for the first time motivated them to return. The clinic did not have to chase people down like they thought they might. Dr. Gandhi explained that because people with the highest viral loads are more likely to transmit HIV, treating them with the best drugs we have available should be a priority if we hope to end the epidemic. Now 290 people, or 10% of her clinic, are on long-acting medications, the director of King County's Sexual Health Clinic Dr. Matthew Golden, said one recent Phase 3 randomized control trial also showed that injectables worked better than pills for patients facing homelessness, poverty, and drug addiction. Golden said that incentives for study participants likely helped, and if we were smart, our public health system would offer benefits for regular treatment, too, if UW's drug ever hits the market, that goal could be even easier to achieve. UW's shot has the potential to be cheaper and more widely available than any injectable we have now. If or when that happens depends on what researchers find in the lab and whether funders come along. Cash in hand. Science is expensive.